Welcome back, the Summit 2 by G2A.com Europe. And it's day number 14 of European play, and we're getting down to the back end of this round robin stage. And teams are slowly starting to settle in to their top or low positions. That could very much mean immediate tiebreakers or a free ride towards that playoff. So, with our sixth matchup, man, it's been a long day thus far. We got seven total Ten today. Seconds. This sixth Nine. matchup's going to feature Team Tinker, or Team Marino Tinkerino, Five taking on Cloud9, who actually been absent from Summit Play for quite a while, obviously with good reason. There's been a lot of tournaments happening all Cloud over the place. A lot of players, pretty jet-lagged, pretty fatigued. Not to say that that should be taking away from a whole lot, but regardless, we'll see here, looking to bounce back as Team Tinker, uh, three losses in the recent Summit Play has been bit surprising to everyone. Regardless, bringing you the coverage is going to be myself, Cottle Guy. Blaze, joining me remote me, uh, remotely, rather. expecting big things out of this matchup. Team Tinker Reno, Cloud man, nine. they're falling short Time quite a bit. I think they're ready to come back strong here, though they are sporting a stand-in with uh, Come With Me. How do you think they're going to fare up going against Cloud9? It's tough to say. It's been a long day for, for all of us, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been doing a lot of games back-to-back. -back. Uh, switching out EGM for Come With Me, I don't Ten consider an improvement. Uh, obviously, stand-ins in general are not going to be able to coordinate with the team as effectively. Five but I, I like the opener for the draft. I mean, Tide Witch, she can't go wrong with that. I mean, that's going to have some good team fight here. But Reserve Cloud9 time. get an interesting opener for themselves. I mean, with the banning out uh, respectfully of Eternal Envy's Terrorblade and perhaps Fata's Brew, they open up Pilot Eye's IO as well as this Necrophos pickup. We've been seeing him a lot recently, and man, I can't yeah. just overemphasize how impactful he can be for the game. But uh, we'll see that Reaper Slice come into play, what kills he will acquire. But I, I think that uh, Team Tinker, knowing what they're up against this early on, might be able to play that survivability strat. Try to make it so that Necrophos can't find an opening where there's a low HP hero. Because you just keep him alive, you mech him up, you yep. restore them up, and you just try to nullify his presence entirely. That's why it's such a smart band to get rid of that AA. Could be just one hero that can ruin your whole day with a synergetic lineup like this one. But really, sh Secret, the team that kind of unveiled this duo and how it can really have so much potential has slowly begin to percolate more teams as they tried to bring in it themselves. I mean, we saw, you know, big plays Dyer from Secret. Uh, as of recently, we saw Goblax team. Uh, I believe yesterday, Virtus Pro Polar also ran with the same kind of lineup. And now we're going to see Cloud9 do it themselves. We've already saw during Star Ladder how much uh, Eternal Envy can do with Necrophos himself. Now with uh, the IO already on their side, I imagine remaining. this is going to be a big thing for them. Big strat start, and I'm curious to see how Team Tinker are going to reply. They remaining. grab a hold of the Witch Doctor, who obviously can work pretty nicely against two targets who are looking to tether so close together with that cast. Reserve but time. So... That big team fight synergy with Tidehunter, they might go for overall Dyer huge team. AoE impact to kind of counter uh, counterbalance against the sustain factor of Cloud9. Yeah, I, I think there is going to be a lot of sustain coming too. Because, I mean, if you just think about IO and Necro as a pairing, the big thing to look to is the tether regen. You're able to make sure that maybe through our Boots of Soul Ring, Necrophos always has the mana to work with. And when it comes to keeping them alive, and not just having a mechanism or a magic wand or bottle or all the other items that you expect to see from IO, Ten but the fact that remaining. Death Pulse itself will go back to Necrophos via the tether. It's actually Five a really bad remaining. heal naturally. It only does 130 healing, which is half of the damage that it deals, not even. Reserve but uh, when you get the tether regen, you multiply that by 2.5, you get 325 okay. HP per death pulse. That's on only a five Cloud second cooldown. So very spammable, very sustainable. Keep him up and it's also hard to choose who to focus down. Do you focus the IO because he's keeping the Necro alive to an extent and obviously the overcharge is going to give him a lot of good mitigation? Or are you going to focus the Necro just to try to take that death pulse out entirely? It really comes down to how quickly you can kill which target. 
So to touch base now, uh, just as far as how these teams have progressed along in the Summit 2 currently, Tinker, remaining. after their recent three losses, has brought them down now to 6-4, and four, which puts Five them about third place remaining. position here in the Round Robin group stage. For Cloud9, who have been out for a little bit and are looking Reserve to make up a lot time. of games real quick, uh, they're currently sporting a 3-2 and two record, so looking to bring in a lot more wins to kind of secure themselves, not towards, you know, a lot more towards the top of the peak, at least in the tiebreaker spot would be a little more comfortable. So the more wins, the merrier for them as they still have a long way to go. We could see big Cloud9 double, triple, even quadruple headers in the upcoming days of Europe play. But they're looking for the third pick now, something to balance out this line out a little bit further. Uh, I'm curious to see what kind of big team impact they want. They're trying to prioritize banning out on the side of Team Tinker, getting rid of those precious offlaners. They do leave uh, a Centaur, I believe, in the pool, Dyer still available if they want to go for it. But Cloud9 instead grab a hold of Jakiro here, who many of these Western teams, specifically like the NA teams and like Cloud9, they, they love this Jakiro, even in a core position. But with the lineup as it stands, I feel like this will be more of a support Jakiro, something that Aoi loves to play. And I mean, this is objective gaming right here. Jikiro is going to facilitate them to take towers, to take Roshan, and uh, the Reaper Scythe is going to be the tool that gets them to do that confidently. Remaining. They take a hero out of the fight, they take a tower. They take uh, do it again, they take Roshan, Five they get Aegis. Remaining. They just keep this momentum rolling. To the point that I, I really expect that Cloud9 will be able to take down Reserve a majority time. of the outer towers by, say, the 25-minute mark. It, it's not far-fetched at all even though Team Tinker have some decent turtling heroes, some decent heroes that can fight on their terms. The Tide and the Witch Doctor are really good at it. The Viper, he's not one that you tango with too lightly either. I mean, the Corrosive skin uh, magic resistance is going to be very impactful here against Necrophost and Jakiro, and yeah, he's going to be able to survive pretty well himself. So I really am curious how Team Tinker want to respond. Last time we saw a little bit of Timbersaw play for Sing Sing. This time they've got the Tide Hunter which they could throw to the offlane and probably will. So uh, for here, you're looking for counter-pushing and early fighting supports and one hard carry. So wave clearing is of the utmost potential, I would imagine, then. It's kind of bouncing mm -hmm. on top of that with a, an additional support who can add a bit of wave clearing. Maybe if they favor extra lockdown. I mean, Shadow Shaman would be something I'd lean back on if this was the olden days with how much of a big dire... Uh, advantage they used to have with the Roche Pit, but Shadow Shaman hasn't quite been the same from what he used to. Ten so I'm curious remaining. to see. It's going to be Ogre, you know, Ogre, the new Platinum Cloud kind of support that most teams like to run pick. for. I mean, what's there to hate? It, like <laughs> someone, Jakiro has a stun, has a slow as well, has huge stats, huge stat gain as far as being a big muscle, kind of a bouncer in these lanes. Now when you have a, a potential offlaner, which could be, you know, the clockwork, could be the centaur who's still left and available, he'll be right there to kind of keep him zoned back and out of that EXP range and allow a little bit of extra space for the potential uh, safe lane core farmer. With remaining. Who could be the fifth pick, I'd imagine, for Tinker? That'll be that role, but we'll have Five to see. It's Cloud9's remaining. choice now. And I'm curious to see, man. Oh, goodness. That's that's pretty all push. That's a lot of push right there. That's a, that's a Warlock. Now, oh, man, the last time I saw Warlock played in a really awesome manner was the C region Summit 2. And Team MVP Phoenix ran with a dual lane Warlock that did absolute work, was maxing the upheaval in addition to the Shadow Word. But with the IO already picked up, uh, it's really hard to say what this Warlock's going to end up being. It's really curious to see how they play it. It's all about the laning for Warlock, Reserve how he gets time. into a position where he can make things happen. Because his skills naturally are really Five powerful, but yes. getting him there, not always the easiest thing. The Golem got quite a few nice little buffs in the most recent patch, add. as well Fatal Bond scaled up a little bit higher there, just uh, 20 to 25%, not shabby at all when you consider the AoE damage this team is going to be putting out. But we'll see. Um, for now, they're going to ban out the team. Centaur. They want to make sure that when they engage fights with this Golem, that it's going to be the fight breaker, that they're not going to be able to be disengaged on. Maybe you could see like a defensive song of the Siren type play come up for Team Tinker if they wanted to give uh, like Pycat a Naga or something like that. But otherwise, they don't really have any way to disengage, any options for them to disengage from fights. And that means when Cloud9 move to take something, that's it's going to be theirs, essentially. Ten they just have to, to sign on the dotted line there because they have all the tools to make it happen. I mean, what do you think, though, Five as far as where they're going to end up putting this Warlock? Is this a mid-lane Warlock, and they put the Necrophos and Io in a different lane? And I just feel like Warlock just needs to be Cloud able to get those levels quickly, so he needs <laughs> solo XP gain. It's just everything revolves mostly around his ultimate on when it is the time to kind of release its true fury. 
Uh, yeah. Even though his other abilities were buffed up a little bit, you know, his Fatal Bonds can do serious work, and we already know upheaval in the right hands, and I know Owie personally is a high preacher of how much upheaval can really add. Do you think it's going to be repped in the mid lane, or is he going to have to be working as a backstaff? It, it's really speculative at this point, but I think that they could make it work as a supportive hero if they wanted to give like a core Jakiro. If Jakiro builds up his macro prior really hard, maybe get, I'm not saying gets agonims, but gets a Veil of Discord and gets He's level 11 pretty early, the Warlock Upheaval is a huge setup tool for that. So you could get something like a Void Chronosphere or other way of keeping people locked in place for the upheaval to take effect and then you follow that up with the macro pyre and the crazy damage every time i have a lot of respect for the potential Five damage output there remaining. um i have seen actually io necrophos go in aggro tries which is very interesting um because they have so much self-sustain between one another they can actually go into those little 2v2 and 3v3 skirmishes very readily and it is going to be eternal envy on the necrophos by the way so yeah, I, I think this is going to be yep. Aoi 2000 on the Warlock, and as you mentioned, he is the one who has been just preaching about this upheaval at least one point, or you're doing it wrong. I'm so curious how they're going to lane this about. If they do, I mean, just throwing out spitball and putting it against the wall, some will stick, some won't. I mean, if they could just keep Jakiro in the offlane by himself, they roll with the Necrophos Wisp duo on the bottom. I mean, they have plenty of sustain where they could hold the fort if needed. And then what if they keep Aoi near the mid lane running like a duel? I mean, alongside with Fata. Prepare I mean, I'm sure Fata could bring it on his own, but I just the dual lane mid Warlock, working in the same sense that we've seen like a Lich and a Wisp kind of work, it has a lot of potential there. We'll have to see, though, for Aoi, for someone who preaches on the hero. I'm now very excited to see him pick it up in his own hands and how much he could put to use, especially with that upheaval. So with that said, though, we've hopped into the game. We're underway now. It's game number six of the day. And, well, it's going to be a matchup between Cloud9 going against Team Tinker. And I'll lead off your introductions here on your Radiant side. For Cloud9, it's going to be Mr. Eternal Envy himself. He's going to be playing your Necrophos, lingering about this top lane. It's also going to be played uh, with Wisp, Pylai Dai. Right behind, it's going to be Bone7 playing what looks like your offlane position, Jikiro. In your mid lane, it's going to be Fata playing your Templar Assassin. And that, of course, will leave Warlock in the hands of Aoi. 30 seconds to battle. Yeah, should be pretty interesting to see. We're going to see in turn on the Dire side, Team Tinker going to be rocking the dual supports of Come With Me Ogre Magi and Bulba on the Witch Doctor. are going to be in a defensive posture up here with Koikova on the Lycanthrope that does leave Pycat to take the Viper to the mid lane. And on the off lane is going to be your Sing Sing Tide. No boots or anything like that, but we are going to see a skirmish for the first rune. Yep, right at the top rune. It's going to be Come With Me, but begins. Ogre. One of the best stats to start out in the game it is able to step away from any early aggression. And the Illusion is going to be grabbed up promptly from Necrophos there on Eternal Envy. Takes that with him to the top lane and will use it to his advantage to bring in some early additional CS for himself. He has put already the early level into Death Pulse to lead things out. Uh, I imagine he'll do the one reliable point in a hard stopper and just kind of build from there. And it looks like they've thrown together a nice little aggressive tri lane here. And side yeah. by side with Warlock and Wisp, that is so much freaking heal with a shadow word. This Necrophos is not going to be going down anytime soon without proper lockdown and some sort of good game plan from the side of Team Tinker. If Team Tinker is smart about this, they will only focus one target. They will either gun down the Wisp or they will gun down the Necrophos. If they kind of do it a little bit of both, then there's going to be too much value coming out of this Tether heal. They need to make sure that one of the two is at full HP, the other is focused down entirely. Uh, I also like this Ring of Pro oh, okay, we're going to see Cask bounce once. Not the best Cask, but maybe. Oh, Owie very low, and there's your heals coming into play. He actually throws it on himself, not the Wisp first, which could have brought a little bit of additional heal, oh. but regardless, the he heal, needs to get off. But. It only works if the Wisp is injured. He's full HP, so oh, it would be nothing no for him. Oh, he has no yet. Yeah, okay. That makes a lot more sense. Looked like he was taking a little bit, but he does opt instead. Eat a Tango, that does help, certainly. And he does give him a little bit of clarity, so he gets extra benefit from that. So, nice grab from there. Also, very curious as to, I guess, Cloud9, they felt comfortable enough to pull out the TA grab at the end, knowing that they will be putting her potentially against this Viper in the mid lane, and Viper is a no nemesis to TA. Makes her life a living hell, and already is doing so 8-6 and six to TA's 4-1 and one as she continues to get harassed and is down only to one shared Tango. Yeah. 
It's not as skewed of a matchup as I think some people make it out to be. I actually had some fun watching the, the BTS guys do a, a drunken night of uh, TA versus Viper. They gave the handicapped matchup to whoever they thought was the worst of the two players. But uh, a lot of the times the Templar Assassin can win out, depending on the build, depending on the positioning. It's possible. It's not a easy win, but it is definitely a doable. All oh, the cask is going to be huge here, though. Bouncing back and forth. It does barely get the maximum range, but Paladai will still fall for the first blood. The timing from Bulba, and, and just part of the reason is point out the draft why just Witch Doctor works so good with these kind of groups that just need to be so close together like your Wisp, like your Brewmaster is just allows for easy stun setups at the right time and because of that cast they get the first blood grab right there taking down Pylai Dai. Who else will be handing over the first blood on the side of Cloud9? <laughs> <laughs> Tactical feeding indeed, but he's gonna come in. He now has opponent overcharge, which is big because now it's got not just they can't just focus eternal envy. There will be overcharge. There will be bottle. There will be other heals coming into play. Eternal envy, I think, is unkillable here because he's got the shadow word. He they've got all these really good mechanically speaking powerful heals, and they just team taker don't have the DPS for it. Straight up, it's kind of a MMO term, but in this case, he is the raid boss, and he's not gonna be going down. He also started like... off with. Sorry, go ahead. And he started off with a ring, double ring of protection, so he very clearly is going for Tranquil Boots plus Basilius, and then he'll probably transition into Soul Ring, which he can turn into Bloodstone. Man, oh man. This is just like a lineup you put together with you and two friends, and you want to be able to do a good job in a pub and just kind of dominate mm -hmm. one particular lane, and you take it to the offensive side, the aggressive tri-lane coming out. That just forces Koikva now. He just can't really get involved with a whole lot without eating a bit of damage. He's 8-0. In comparison to Necrophos, who's 13 and 1. They're just getting a lot of work done in this top lane for now. Mid lane, Fata continues to struggle a little bit. He's 13 and 4 to Viper's 19 and 9, so PyCat's still definitely laying it into him here. Bottom lane, a lane that's been relatively quiet, and Sing Sing actually finding really good farm for himself. Is tied up with the mm -hmm. top now at the top 21 and 0. You know, Tidehunter just going a 1 on 1 matchup. He's one of the few that could definitely get it done against most. Jakiro could definitely give him a run for his money here, but Bone 7 is not finding equals amount of CS for himself and is just kind of making do with what he can. Yep, so we are going to be seeing a lot of push pressure coming out pretty soon. It is going to be multiple sets of soul rings. Uh, one going to be coming out for the Jakiro. I expect one for the Necrophos and possibly one for the Wisp, but I think that might be a little bit overkill on the Emo ring there. But yeah, as far as... Uh... Early game, to Sing Sing did pick up like eight tangos and a sap, so he was going to sustain, but now he's out deep. and he's going back. They're going deep for Koikfa here. Find the tower with uh, Pylai Dai there. Dyer's he's going to feel pretty confident. This is smart. Yep, they're going to do it real quick, and they better get out because coming in from behind is the rest of Team Tinker. Leading out the fronts come with me here, but they're trying to find the right focus. It's going to be Wisp. He leads out with a fire blast, but he gets healed up right there from the word. Uh -oh. Cast flies out, and they might be able to finish up High Lie Die, but the heal is still coming in. They do manage to bring him down. They have to work damn hard for it. They might lose Bulba. They will. Right click comes on through, and it's going to be Necrophos who cleans up the pesky little Bulba support, but look at the upheaval. That is what they're preaching about, boys and girls. Is he, he is straggling to try to get away from this one, and he, he is persistent. He's not letting up yet. He's still oh. slow that way outside of what looks like the AoE. Yeah. But man. It does persist a little bit. There's a, there's a short duration afterwards. I don't know if it's three <laughs> seconds. Yeah, three seconds after leaving it That's that you crazy. still get the effect. And uh, I honestly think Eternal Envy should have had a kill there. I think he could have killed the other if he started focusing immediately, but he started attacking creeps, thought that it was over. I was like, no, no, it's a people. It's a people. It's not over until I say it's over. Just fills him up so damn quick, and he's just going to keep on running. They are bullying out Team Tinker from this top lane with this Necrophos Wisp lineup with the Warlock just to add on top. Makes it all the easier. They need all the casts they can get to kind of keep them back. They throw it out, and it's enough as they waddle themselves back out. Team Tinker need to figure out what the hell to do here, and... That might be weighing it out till Sing Sing gets together a nice Ravage and possibly a Blink Dagger, really taking it back to Cloud9. Yeah, I, I really am curious about when the Tide rotates. Sing Sing needs to get involved in this top lane attack. or it's just going to be a complete stomp from Cloud9. They already have the CS advantage, 25-1 and one for the Necrophos over the 9-0 and zero for the Lycan. Yeah, TA is losing out in mid, but it's still well worth it for what they're getting out of top and bottom. And uh, yeah, this tower is already down to 300 HP. Like, they are willing to dive it because it's pretty much a non-factor. They're going to get stage. Fata here. Very nice grab for them. Uh, Pycat lingering Mystery about with low life, baits him into a, a skirmish where Come With Me is just waiting behind. They have the dust ready to go. Ignite and the fire blasts are more than enough to easily break through the refraction, and they just quickly run them down like it's nothing. The double bit of slow allows them to not be able to get away. And Team Tinker fire back with a nice kill here and pull ahead 3-1. to one. Yeah. So the 
Team Picker is going to have to get these kills whenever they can. But make the Ravage worth their while, Radiance get these fun individual pickoffs when they can. Because other than that, I really only think the Paralyzing Cask is what they have going for them in early fights. Dyer's cask is really is high potential attack. when they're all close together like this. But they're going to lose out very quickly in net worth. Uh, Necrophos is able to sustain really well with the uh, Death Pulse. And the cool attack. thing about... Oh, actually, bottom lane. Bone 7 probably Dyer's going down here. Yeah, they're chasing falling. down this dragon. The cast kind of just seals the deal for them as they follow him on up. Just gets caught out a little You're too far, done. maybe getting a little too assertive, trying to get the back end of this tower with a last leak with fire, but can't get it. Now, come with me. He's just going to hit it home. One more swing. ought to do it. Boom. Nope. One more swing. Boom. There it is. Dyer's bottom tower <laughs> Sometimes it just takes on that last little touch right there to make sure you get the secure deny. It's, it's going to be big things there for Team Tinker to kind of take away from that because Cloud9, a team that's looking to take objective after objective, like was said in the draft, I mean, that's the first start right there. Actually, the second start. After already taking down the tier one top lane, just remains the one in the mid. And we'll see here, is it still going to be a duel in the meantime between Viper and TA? Yeah. So uh, a couple of missed calls by me as far as item progression, just kind of deceptive in what we've seen from like the what items were sitting on the hero. Um, first and foremost, there was a Sage's Mask and Ring of Regen on Bone 7. He's turning that into Tranquil Boots and Yules, which is two very powerful items on the Energy Hero. As well, this Ring of Protection for Eternal Envy that he started with, is actually a casual one, I believe. I don't think he wants Tranquil Boots right now. It's not that great of an item on Necro in general. And uh, yeah, I think it really is just literally him having a casual ring of protection for the entire early game because they probably run this in Scram and said, hey, I need a little bit better physical mitigation, and that's the answer. I think he's going to go where he did last time in Star Ladder, man. He's going to put together an Atos. He's got the Vite Booster, and there was a Staff of Wizardry on the quarter, which is heading back to base, and it looks like he's going to hold off for now. But Atos, man, huge item. People are quickly realizing on Necrophos adds the life, adds the intel, and of course that long range slow for him to kind of creep on in through you like the old man he is. And that could prove to be pretty big, but they're looking to come in from behind. Bulba's got a nice little invis to work with here. He's not level six, he's only level three, two levels in cask. He's going to spot out Owie here. And here comes Ogre. Got to try to slow him down, pulls out the early cast. Fire Blast is going to be able to catch its mark, and Envy comes in to try to aid it about, and yep, it's going to blow up right back in Bulba's Jeez. face. Boom! Oh. Pulls out the Reaper Scythe. Oh. It's actually not enough to finish him off, surprisingly. But with one last right click, he does finish it off. It allows Ogre to make his escape. So Cloud9 are still able to take off a kill. And what could have been a pickoff attempt right there from TT ends up being a, a support grab for Cloud9. Yeah, but still, I mean, the Witch Doctor not being down for the extra 30 seconds is huge. I, I'm really surprised that Reaper Scythe didn't finish him. Dropped him down to 34 HP, but that Voodoo Restoration just... Bringing it up enough and just skewing the numbers a little bit. Fun the numbers, making it so that they weren't able to calculate exactly what they needed to do as far as that ultimate damage output. A pilot is going to take some annoying harassment from these wolves. They turn invisible, they regen HP, and then they keep hitting this low armor wisp. But in the end, it's just going to be him having enough HP to work with to use his bottle to heal up Eternal Envy and make him feel safe in farming. And that's a thing that you can't necessarily say with a Necrophos. Oftentimes, you're the, the main target. You drop down easy, and oh. in this case, you don't have to worry about it. I think Owie's in trouble. He's like ringing around Radiant's here. Think he's got a people. You do not attack. dive this guy. You get so many TPs in your face. Like this is worse than diving and undying on your tower. This is that would be just a complete mistake. They would turn it around 100%. It looks like Team Tinker know that. They quickly pull back. Singh was just kind of waltzing around a bit with his former uh, colleague and co-player. And we'll just kind of pull back all the way back to the base in the meantime for now. He does have his Blink Dagger, so we'll get a hold of that and look to put it right to use. You see Jakiro get a hold of his Yules now. It's a big grab for him on the uh, Cloud9 sign. Boat 7 can now set up for the easy Ice Pass, easy Macropyre laydowns. He also gets a hold of his Atos. He's looking to put it to work. Here. Oh. He puts it all ready to use, throws it on the Pie Cat, and they turn their attention and take him down easily. Pylai die though, very low. Can't get away from the Ravage, unfortunately, and falls. Nice jumping from Sing Sing. And they're going right on EE, but that ice path beautifully laid down. Macro Pyre to zone them all the way back out. There's another AA Atos, or EE Atos rather, gets put on to come with me. And, well, he throws out the Fire Blast, ultimately will be taken down. And now, beautiful setup. Yule's in the ice path, pressure on to Sing Sing. Global, one attack on the trap. He's still low. The Atos as well, so much slow. Anchor Smash will allow him to now make a swift escape. But he's still very, very low here. EE still creeping nearby, has his Reaper Scythe. Locked and loaded if he wants to make a, another grab, but it looks like TT are going to have to be a little more hesitant about this. Yeah, they really didn't get much out of that Ravage. They didn't have the follow-up, so only the Wisp goes down, and yeah, like you said, so with the nice Ice Path, they're, uh, so Cloud9 are able to pull ahead. They need a big Ravage. They need a huge Ravage with a lot of follow-up, and right now they're not finding anything. And uh, it's going to be quick. Wow. Going to be going oh down my. the last right click. 
That transform time. That, yep. That, you can't say any other 1.5 seconds all it takes for them to get the job done. And the last little heel is even faster than he could get away from on that new race car speed of 650. And he ends up going down. Very confident to Krofos with Pylidae nearby. Just proves to be just too beefy for Team Tika to really approach it. Now they turn their sights on this attack. Tier 2 tower. This is a Dyer's huge swing towards them. 4K and rising on the Dyer's rapid here for Cloud9 as they will be able to clear out and secure this Tier 2 tower. It's Team Tinker who are looking potentially at a 0-4 and four run here in the Summit. Yeah, it's really difficult for them right now. I mean, if they can get Korkva, the Vladimir's offering, he can just completely explode in terms of farmer rates. He can clear out his jungle, no problem. He can build up, and they do have the, the mechanism up on the Viper, so it's not all bad, but not a lot of it is good. They still need the levels on the supports. They need some multicasts, they need some death wards, or we're going to just see more Ravages that only kill a support, and uh, that's just not going to cut it. We already see, as I was saying, uh, objective Dota with this uh, Jakira pickup, but also with the TA. Both of them extremely good at taking down Roshan, and we see that happening in no time at all. Maybe Quickville gets the, the badass deny here with the Wolves in play, but it looks like they're going to go down too early, and it is going to be the Aegis in the hands of Cloud9. Yeah, specifically, Eternal Envy going to be the one to pocket down that Aegis. And as if he wasn't confident enough before, now he's just going to be able to swagger himself right into the heat of the battle and be able to get out as much damage as possible. Oh, that Atos okay. has been putting in the muscle, but up top lane, relocate goes right on top of Koikva here, and he just goes down immediately. It's Fata who dishes in the big damage and moves on to a killing spree after the on-paper struggling matchup against a Viper. He's quickly coming back into his own here with the pickoff. It certainly does help. Nonetheless, Pylidai makes his return to mid lane, and... All is going very well for Cloud9 Radiant's thus far. We're only approached the 13-minute mark, and they're taking control of damn near a 6K gold oh, lead. Now it's no. Owie getting caught out with a Viper Strike, and the Cask can Pylai die. Aid here, Owie, who does pull on back, gives himself the Shadow Word, and he's going to be A-OK. -okay. Fata, though, creeping on in oh. from the north. Big slam from that Warlock stops PyCat from getting away, and now this Viper Where is going to be under pressure going? in the upheaval. Oh, Slowly not allowing PyCat to get away, and even Bulba is going to have to be forced to be pulling out a TP. Luckily, that quick wit reaction of escape gets him out of there, but PyCat not going to be so lucky. It's C9 once again who come out on top. Damn. I'm really surprised that Cloud9 don't have an Arcane Boots. That's the only thing that I, I don't like about this currently, is that they have a Wisp, which can do so much potential mana restoration with either a Soul Ring or an Arcane Boots, and they're relying on bottles and magic sticks only. So, uh, the fact that the mechanism comes out for Decrophos means he has to essentially choose in many fights between using a mechanism or using a Reaper Scythe. He's actually plenty of times Dyer's just used Death Pulse instead of Reaper, so attack. I guess that decision is not too hard for him, but I think that mana is their only issue from taking this game, and if they can fix that, they can look to breach high ground very soon. But for now, great play with the upheaval out of 2000, uh, just making it happen with the support warlock, getting a lot of value out of this pick. Certainly so. We might see a defense Dyer's now. Svata approaches the top lane. Jakiro scouting out the front. Those wolves are going to be constantly on watch, however. Come With Me is lingering nearby. They're thinking that they might be able to make a go here in Jakiro, but they don't know that nearby Fata waits. Fata could be advancing in. He doesn't have a blink dagger, but he can get there damn near quick with a nice little set of phase boots. Pulls out the trap and already goes on to Come With Me before he makes his way out. Bone7 lays a very nice ice path, and look who it is. It's Eternal Envy showing up with his good old friend Pylite Eye, and they take it home with a very nice place, Reaper Scythe. <laughs> that full Sadist regen, just giving them back the full Manavar entirely, and they're just going to TP bottom. They can defend this uh, most likely, and then they can look to push the Tier 2 off of that. But they did just use Reaper Scythe, and there is a Blink Rabbit. We'll see if the Aegis does get broken here. Pulls out his mech, and now is still trying to take it to Pycat. He's on the retreat. Wisp is nearby, but he's going to need some help here. Aegis goes down. Sing jumps forward, sets it up with a Ravage, but it's only going to be Owie else. And now Wisp comes in. Big damage, that upheaval. Hold Sing Sing in place, he's gonna be forced to TP as they don't have the stun and, well, he doesn't have the Reaper Scythe to stop him. So a nice little escape yeah. right there from Sing, but it just goes to show that C9 are still very dominant in this Dyer's one after expending a attack. Ravage and having their whole team there, they can only take down the one Aegis life. Yeah, still it's very nice for Team Digger to have this Aegis, this t TP play coming through. Anytime they use a Town Portal Girl, they're home free unless there's a Jakiro involved. The two stuns that Cloud9 have outside the Jakiro are ultimates and are often not expended for that purpose. So in that case, no Golem, no Scythe, and uh, Bone 7 was still pushing on top. So they are able to disengage with minimal casualties. It's not going to put them back in the game, but at least they're not getting steamrolled at this point. Bulba will be looking towards his Death Ward with this next creep wave, and 
Uh, if they can get that with the Ravage, it would be huge. But obviously, Sing Sing did pop that down bottom. Pushing on forward, Fata here might be in a little too deep. The dust is going to be there. They see you, Fata, and now he eats the full Death Ward and a nice little Big multi deal. on top. And he's done, but look who's coming in from behind. Relocate Bulba. Nope, not going to finish him off. That heal keeps him alive. That heal kills him as it comes out of the Death Pulse. Oh, Wisp ends up getting blown up. Here comes Warlock, though, dropping down the Chaotic Offering, and now Sights are turned on EE -E here. He's making him work for it damn hard, but the Viper Strike will hold him in his place. And it is going to be TT who come back with this one, making it a three for one when it's done, and a pretty big gold sweep coming away. Almost 3K in their Jeez. favor. They need this one, and they got it. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what put them back in the game. It's just Cloud9 underrating the value of the 6.82 uh, rubber band gold effects and saying, okay, we could take this and snowball momentum even if we play sloppy. And it's just not true. In this metagame, you do not have that much more room for error. You can play some shenanigans, you can goof off a little bit, but in the end, you have to make sure that your movements are precise, and that was anything but precise. The relocate in, the death wards that keep coming down on this witch doctor who's healing back up, it's just they're not uh, crunching the numbers well enough. They don't think about what they're they just kind of react and I, I think that they should probably be the the ones that are proactive rather than reactive in this situation atos will come down a bottom lane this is yeah, <laughs> along the lines of what i'm talking about but another tp is yeah. gonna speed him away to the point that you almost think ee might as well go for like a yules himself go. like it's so frustrating to see all these tps yeah the one thing that necro can't even do he's trying to get something done even on his own right using those boots of travel to just try to get a hold of bulba but Oh, well, ain't no joke. He ain't no pushover, man. He'll have a TP ready to go if necessary, and he pulls on back out. Bottom lane, though, they do finish out that Tier 2 tower, so even more gold now coming the way towards C9, and just kind of give you the idea. Team Tinker, they do crawl back with that fight, but there's still plenty of gold on this map to get a hold of. For a team that has a Lycan, they have yet to even take one Tier 1 tower on the side of Cloud9. So, I mean, they keep a track of his jungle, too. They have the trap. It doesn't block spawns, but they know he's there, and they're going to try to use this Invisor to their advantage to bring him down. He does have that shapeshift, so they need a lot more than just one hero. And it's actually going to be a smoke that breaks. Do they have the oh. detection out in time? No, the dust is there, but there's no way they catch him. No, and they... Oh, oh they kind of figure out too late, like, hey, wait, the, the, the smoke is not here anymore. Huh? Is he over here? And they kind of just casually throw out a dust, but unfortunately... Not going to get lucky with any sort of uh, dust throw out, but still, Fata in the neighborhood here. Creeps on four, but this time he does have help nearby. Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to cross the path here, and Team Tinker are going to make a slight escape, but they move on forward. They see Owie. This might be their opportunity to get a quick pickoff on the support. Oh, oh relocate. Nice save. Pulls him out and over to the left-hand side, away from that death ward that's already been invested on the side of Team Tinker. And that's a nice little save right there. Now they are going to go back, and they're going to try to take advantage of this little positioning. The yeah, could go on Pylai Die, the long tether, the multi, not enough to bring him down, and EE is going to be right there to heal him up with the pulse, and even the force coming out, pushing him even closer towards his allies. Now look at the bounce back, Vata jumps forward, doesn't quite get enough damage up just quite yet, but there goes the Atos, they slow down, come with me, he's trying to get away from this one, Reaper Scythe locks him in his place, but obviously not enough to burst him down, but here comes the Chaotic Offering drop, still come with me, makes his way out, finally he falls, Ravage on return, locks him in place, but EE still lives, Fata locked in behind, but the sentry gets dropped. They finish him off. It's Koikva on the hunt trying to take down the ball. The puppy wants his ball. He gets it. He takes it down. Now Eternal Envy gets bashed up here, and they're trying to burst him down. Mech's going to be used. Bulba coming in to add a little bit of extra sustain for Koikva to fight this one out. They work past, mm -hmm. and now the upheaval briefly locks them in place, but it looks like Owie's now under pressure team. from Pycat. They're still making a move in. Eternal Envy turns oh. the corner, puts his attention on Bulba, who gets blasted Kill. down with a dual breath. You Eternal Envy ends up dropping, and now Viper trying to orb walk down Bone 7, who's going to continue to get chased up from these wolves, and now healed up from Owie. It looks like the combo slowly roll on attack. through, and when the dust clears, we're evened up 11 for 11. To be honest with you, it's really hard to say at the end of that one who ended up coming out on top. I think Team Tinker are really happy with the amount of gold they were able to acquire from it, but Cloud9, really, their main objective there wasn't to take the fight in full. They had Bone 7 for, I swear, like a 90 seconds straight, just hammering home on the bottom lane at that Tier 3. Takes down the Tier 3, does some chip damage on the range racks, and uh, I kind of feel like that was tactically the wrong decision. I know Cloud9 loved to spread the map, and there is a lot of value in the rat that he was able to accomplish there. Open, exposed racks are something that they could take advantage of very soon, but... If they had the Jakiro there, I think that's just an open and shut book as far as that team fight goes. They get a good Reaper Scythe off, they get a great AoE damage from the Bone 7, Blink, and uh, 
ice pass, and I think they really could have done a lot more work with him as a part of it, but they make the decision to, to rat it out with him, and they still uh, take something, although Team Tinker do get uh, a decent comeback. Oh, quick yeah, quick fuck. Caught out with the Yules, an easy setup. Just allows for a perfect relocate in, and a TE who benefits from it. Finishing it off with a very nice Reaper Scythe, and a little bit of creepy dialogue to follow, of course, because it's Nick Crow. Now they send them back to where he once came, which is top lane, where he'll continue to farm it on up, and that smoke gate that came out from Team Tinker pretty much led them nowhere, unfortunately. But now, Sing Sing, he has the Invis rune. He's using that bit of intel. Oh, Ward dropped. Now they see him. Yeah, they, they know, know they there. dropped it, though. Dyer's but I think that it's really important attack. to note that uh, Team Tinker have to control this Roshan. If they give Rosh away to Cloud9, that's going to be enough to break the base open. We do see up top the last Dyer tier tower will fall, but Dyer's they're much more worried about their bottom lane right fallen. now. The fact that Bone 7 was able to just chew through that in full, it took a lot of time, but... Little Good Fire did its job, and a single Aegis, and that's going to be a broken lane of racks, which is something at this stage I don't see them coming back from. Sing pressing forward with a blink and a force. He's looking to try to get a hold of someone. He, he steps back, gives him the old Atos treatment, and Sing Sing will not be able to pursue there. So it looks like Team Tinker very hungry to try to get a hold of something. They want some sort of pickoff. So then they can segue into that Roche Pit if necessary, but Dyer's look who's already getting work inside. It's going to be Aoi and Fata right now. For now, just the two of them hand in hand trying to get it done. Wisp now shows up to this party, and they're going to start dropping some sentries down. They see all this extra vision already, and uh, Team Tinker know, though. I think they already have an idea of this is happening. Oh, but no, top lane, that's where, uh, yeah, Pycat ends up going down. It's a... It's a Ravage timer that's been given out to everyone, apparently, on the side of Cloud9. <laughs> Probably a mistype, but yep. regardless, it's enough for uh, them to get a quick pickoff right there, and they're going to have to separate from this Roche area and just kind of proceed and move elsewhere. Well, it's nice to have a little insight of who's keeping track. Uh, the timer callers, uh, they're really the most underrated people that you can have on a team, and uh, calling out the cooldowns and a actually doing the math and adding in that extra 150 seconds, that's... Uh, a really a valuable thing for a team but anyways yeah that is a overextended eternal envy and he does get punished for it almost as his bkb soon though and there's not much they can do to him after he picks it up uh, i have to say that i feel uh, it seems like he's maybe might be a little bit inexperienced with this draft like i think he's obviously run a, a handful of times but it's not your general eternal envy hero we've seen him do some amazing things with illusion based heroes and uh split pushing hard carries but in this case here it definitely is a whole nother hand of cards with the necrophos so maybe he's still getting acclimated to it. We can excuse a few reprecise missing on Witch Doctors and such. But in the end, uh, I think if they can really perfect the strat and really optimize Eternal Envy's performance on the hero in particular, this could be extremely, extremely scary for any team to face in the tournament setting. Ogre puts down his sentry with uh, Cloud9. They spot it out. Oh, he's right there. And the Wolves are going to be coming in, bringing in that intel. And... Cloud9 see those wolves, so they each know what the hell's happening right now. As Roche gets brought down to a third life, it doesn't look like Team Tinker are going to defend this. As you can tell by the momentum of their team, they're kind of moving on through their own jungle. They're going to have forfeit this one over. Turtle Envy's going to pick up the Aegis, and they immediately pop Radiance the smoke, and they want to get more attack. from it right now. They're not going to wait a bit. That's what Team Tinker are anticipating, is that Cloud9 are going to pull off, farm a bit more, but that's not going to be the case. They immediately yeah. jump forward. They had spotted out, come with me because of this ward, and they just finish him. Immediately with a Reaper Scythe to top it on off. He's out of this game for a minute. We'll see you later there, Ogre. Cloud9. Yeah, 36 seconds to 66. This is, uh, this is their opening. This is where they break through into the main base. They do have the Templar Assassin farmed up quite substantially, and they most importantly have two BKBs. Actually, no, sorry. The Eternal Envy one is on the courier, but it's not here just yet. Once they get the BKBs, they're going to feel confident, but I'm not sure if they, even with the Ogre down, they go in against the Ravage. And looking to press in now from the bottom. Already that tier 3 taken down. They're going to open up on the already exposed racks here. Quickly pulling out the heal to clear out the creeps as Fata is going to eat the Viper Strike. Fortified. And kind of hold it back for now. Team Tinker being a little more hesitant as far as what kind of engagement Radiant's they want to make. They still have the attack. Ravage here from Sing Sing available. But he is way back inside the fountain. He smokes up now and he's going to creep through the tree line now. Maybe look for a big Ravage, hopefully big on the weekend. outskirts of the base. 
and still it's EE leading at the front. He's got that Aegis, so he's happy to kind of sacrifice his first life for a Ravage if necessary. Look at him. Uh, Sing Sing wants the that, but there's just no follow up. Like you can hit a four or five man Ravage right there, but there's nobody to bring it uh, to something Radiance's more. They need the Death Ward attack. in position. It's an Agadim Scepter Death Ward. This is absolutely immense from the Witch Doctor. It, it Bulba could just completely wipe out Cloud Nine if he gets that in full duration Radiance's on disabled targets, but it's uh, it's a difficult one to land. I mean, there's Aegis, there's BKBs. They just get one spell to interrupt that, and Tomb Taker's fight is done. Necrobook's pulled out. Keeping E back, they are so timid about the right time to execute because if it goes south, might as well just throw in the towel at that point. If they have this much of an upper hand for now, so they're actually looking to pursue outside the base here. Come with me. In the front lines, those wolves scouting out ahead. But they're not going to get a hold of anyone. Cloud they pull all the way back onto their own side of the river instead of advancing on forward. Just timid play coming out from both sides. Not looking to give anything unnecessarily away, but Cloud Knights still have plenty of time to work with on this Aegis in case they want to go for a possible re-engagement here. We'll have to see what the next step's going to be. Yeah, still patient. Necro 3 is a, a little bit annoying to Eternal Envy as he doesn't have that much more mana to work with, but yeah, they were able to take the range racks down and melee below half with the fact that they had a 6 versus 4 kind of with the Aegis. But uh, it's going to come down to this next fight. Who's going to be taking they're it gonna, away? They're going to want to jump them from the left-hand side. There's a trap already out, though, and they're pinging it. They know. They see Sing Sing, and they just go ahead and get the Yules. They might have to lose Sing Sing here. He has to try to make his way out because he's the one that kind of set the stage for a big engagement. They need him desperately, but it looks like Cloud9 are looking to move on in. They Boba? jump a big chaotic offering. Sing Sing is desperately trying to get in there. Oh, Boba oh, drops his ward, but gets ice pathed immediately. Sing Sing still wallowing to the middle, gets the Ravage off, but doesn't catch quite enough. He falls right after. And Cloud9, with a big advancement, Sing Sing is going to be forced to buy back to come in. Come with me, pulling them away from the base before they take him down here. Gets off a nice multi, but it's not going to matter a whole lot. It's EE -E now picking up a double. Even Quake are going to have to be on the retreat with a shapeshift. Looks like Team Tinker are going to just have to try their best to spread. Keep them all over the place and away from home base for now. But Koikfa, he can't get away. He's going to get locked down from Fata from behind. You are going to see Sing Sing coming back with a kill from his buyback, getting a hold of Aoi. But Pylai Dai and company still pushing down from the bottom. Now it's going to be a lot easier to finish out. As the racks have already fallen, they might consider going right for Tier 4s. Yeah, this is this is definitely an opportunity for them. They've got the refraction of the golem to tank for uh, just a second here, actually just doing some damage. But Sing Sing trying to delay it, trying to pull some shenanigans. Already picked off the warlock, but will force the wisp away as well. It's pretty important. Will he go for a relocate play though? They have two respawning, and he could bring somebody in. They could bring in the Jakiro if they want right now, but for now it Dyer's looks like a full disengaging. Tower. Yeah, they're just keeping home. Or are they? Fata, oh. locked down. Here's a relocate. Very nice catch right there, and uh, they're going to need some assistance if necessary. Even the dust is going to be popped. Can Pylai die? Get a relocate off the time. He cannot pull him back. He's got five more seconds. Four. But now Fata returning. It's going to be Wisp who falls. But with his last dying breath, can he keep Fata alive to engage? He cannot. Fata ends up falling, and now EE shows up, and he has no escape mechanism as Sing Sing and company want to go on him. Come with me, gets caught by the Jakiro and taken apart by both seven. EE ends up falling, but still is Aegis. Was intact and ready to work with. Koikfo goes into shapeshift form, and they want to try to stop him. He sidesteps away from any sort of ice path. Warlock also still nearby, ready to go with EE and Sing Sing going toe to toe. This Viper comes on in as well, and they are trying their best to kite out this. Kropos as much as possible. Now pulls out the mech, pulls out the BKB. Oh! Reaper Scythe sends Quakefoot to the grave. Not Quakefoot, Pycat run to the grave for 80 seconds. Viper Strike now catches on Bone 7, bringing him really slow to a halt. Sing Sing going to be right there to kind of hammer it home. Still very nice force stuff coming out from Owie, but the Death Ward unleashed from Bulba secures a double at the end of the Tift. When it's all over, Cloud9 lose three in exchange for what looks like no, they lose five all day in exchange for the three. Just a real girthy fight that's getting hard yeah, to recollect think, what the hell actually happened. I think the Necrophos death was the Aegis, but still, I mean, that's yeah, that's, that's right. a big, big impact uh, from Team Tanker, just being able to pull that one out. I think there was a misplay with uh, Pilot Die. He relocated in and got the Tether Bottle Fountain regen all over the Templar Assassin. So Fata went from, like, 10% HP to 40% HP, and I guess that's a choice, really. He had to choose between bringing Witch Doctor or Warlock, war, sorry, the Warlock with the Jakiro to the fight on respawn, 
or healing up the Templar Assassin in that fashion. And in the end, uh, not bringing anybody to extra to the fight, it might have been the wrong call because uh, obviously they didn't get the better end of that tail end. Now, they still have the Rax advantage, they still have general map control, but in that particular skirmish, Team Tinker definitely won out. And now, Tinker get a little bit more out of that one. Still need a lot more, though, to really contest the hefty, hefty farm here of Cloud9, but if they overexert themselves or get a bit reckless with some of their engagements, Tinker can really surprise them. Still plenty of rubber band left in this game for them to make a potential opportunity to open back up. And Cloud9, a team that's also pretty fatigued, jet lagged after a long weekend and a continuous week of Dota. Would love to be able to round out this game sooner than later, be able to just kind of rest and relax before their next set of matches, whether that be an hour from now or even just tomorrow. I'm sure they could use it, so. Now shifting through the jungle, they're gonna bring up a bit of farm. Then, worthy to note, there's a DD rune nearby on the bottom area with Roche timer, the secondary timer getting ready to come up. Might be a per perfect opportunity for a big fight to break out here. Cloud9 control the map for the most part, and I think Team Tinker might consider going for a big play here. They don't have a smoke, it looks like. But Bulba has his shadow amulet, which he, he loves to use on the switch timer. Yeah, it could be uh, some real shenanigans with this one. I mean, if it works, it works. As far as ground target disables, they've got the Ice Path and the Golem. Those are the only two that will actually disable Bulba after he enters the shadows with that Death Ward active. So he's going to be looking for that play. Right now he's got a good flank, but is there detection is the question. Is there a gem on Cloud9? There is not. That's the big deal. If there was a gem, they could just walk up to him and kill him. But as he knows, that at least for the moment, there's no detection, he will just be able to chill out, and at worst, they see that the smoke breaks early. And it looks like uh, they will actually just find Koikva instead. Yeah, they jump all the way, get a hold of Koik for the oh, ice right there, and Reaper, he's out for 85 seconds. There's no life in it. That's your dark horse of Team Tinker, now out of the game for almost a near minute and a half. And for Cloud9... Yeah, they step back, and Roche has a real small timer. Couldn't get better for Cloud9 right now, and they'll just begin to start things off, and this is just going to easily set things up for just a nice way to push into the opponent's base and take a couple of structures, walk away with the win. Team Tinker, they better pull out plan B, plan C, and go for a serious high ground defense. Yeah, the only way that they pull this one out is with some incredible ultimates from Bulba. That's the only way to put Rishon it. Like, they have such an advantage here on Cloud9, and I don't think Tide is going to cut it. Sing Sing is rapidly approaching a refresher. He's got the Force and Arcanes, so he can sustain it if he finishes that item, but Cloud9 are not going to give him the chance. They're going to look to end attack. it before the refresher comes out, and that's on Bulba. 100% on this death ward. Team Tinker, they have to keep him alive, they have to give him space, and in the end, he has to get the ultimate of his lifetime. We'll see if they can do it. It's a tall order. Cloud9 with everything they could ever want. 14k gold lead. Very farmed up. Necrophos leading the way with an Aegis in his pocket, ready to go. Taking charge, and it's going to be more pressure here. They do benefit as their Lycan's about to be back up and ready. This could be their last defensive hurrah, but to lead things off, they want to do something a little more spicy. They smoke up, and they're looking to come in from behind. Dyer's this could be a big play for them. Attack. Worried that they don't see anyone in the base, though. They feel like something's up. Coming in from behind, and Sing Sing going right on Aoi. They focus fire down the Warlock, if possible, with the Fire Blast. They take him out. He gets off the Chaotic Offering before he goes, however. And now an Onslaught breaks out on the backhand side. They take down Ogre for a support support. Now Viper going to be caught out. Reaper's side takes him out. 100 seconds. No comeback from this one. Oh. Sing Sing, nice Ravage. They burst down Pylai Dai, and now it looks like Koikva. Moves on forward and wants to get a hold of someone else with this. Oh, can't quite get in there. Huge damage. He goes in. He immediately pulls on out. And the Ato slows him right into a nice path where he gets caught out and take it down. Eternal Envy cleans him up. And they're on the hunt for Bulba, who's just trying to put him on a wild goose chase, goose chase rather from the base. Shadow Amulet saves him for now, but just takes a couple of AoE spells to take him out. And now he calls him out on his cheeky little play with the Shadow Amulet. <laughs> The PM, um, uh, they're friends. They, they know each other pretty well, so it's it's fun to to josh each other. But yeah, he really just wanted to make something happen, and the death ward wasn't bad, but it wasn't the game breaker they needed it to be. And we're gonna see them push in the mid lane here. Buyback will come out from Viper, probably his last one this game. And uh, Necrophos is finding a 10 second cool cooldown on his ultimate. If he gets that back up and gets a kill with it, the game's over. Now with Agnums, there's 
Guarantee no buyback Dyer's at this point. He's getting right click, but it doesn't look like it. I mean, he's got plenty of life to work with. You just see his ice path. Nice little dodge there from your Viper. There it is. Slow that upheaval. Oh Boom! 80 seconds, no buyback for you, uh, Mr. McGee. He ends up going down. And they take out a set of racks. Atos could be pulled here on Sing Sing, trying to make a getaway. It looks like Team Tinker is going to be taking another loss here. The Summit 2, fourth straight now. Shadow Amulet, Witch Doctor Ult, does a little bit of damage, not quite enough. Jakira ends up going down regardless. Pycat now forced to get away. He's still on the hunt. Slow moving old man, but he's creeping his way through to kind of get a hold of a couple more kills if possible. That's a nice cast that actually locks both himself and Fata in place, but quickly, Pylodai shows up, brings in an extra bit of heal. Wolves are trying to focus fire that Wisp, but they're looking to go for the final set right here and bring out the Megas. Indeed. But uh, this is an opening where Team Tinker are a little bit stronger, I think, if they get the right initiation. Dyer's but obviously they still have that Aegis on Eternal Envy. They've got BKBs on both, so Radiant's it's hard to feel like you have the opening Dyer's here. Viper coming in. Pycat with the TP. This is the committal. Yeah, moving on in. Pycat moves forward. He has to force that all the way back. Now they look towards Fata. Eternal Envy pulls out that ship and slows Dyer's them in. Bubble with no more ultimate. Attack. Just gets out of stun, pulls out a Shadow Amulet, and the Voodoo Registration continues to heal themselves Radiant's up. Dust is going to be popped attack. out here as Fata looks to make an escape, jumping into Sing Sing with that gush, but quickly oh. runs into a bit of damage. Four staff away. They're trying their best to kite out. C9 with those four staffs. Radiant's it's working for now, but attack. it doesn't stop them from taking these set of racks. Because they're focused Ravage. on. Oh, he can't quite get it off yet. Sing Sing's not finding the mark. He blinks outside of the base, it looks like for now. Towards Pylai Die, they finish him off with a nice gust. It's going to be Owie who pulls out Koikfa from the base. Turn towards him, come with me, pulls out the Fire Blast right there. Going to drop a Chaotic Offering, even if it's on Ogre's head. Why not, right? Sing Sing fires back with a very nice Ravage. Gets a double kill with it. And now he's trying to get away. He, he chases him down one more right click, plus that Aura. Nope, it's going to be the Aura that takes him down. Turns back, sees the Viper. Shiva's going to be popped. Death War going to be dropped as well from Boba. This is turning into a disaster for both teams. The Ice Path, this is just like one last rumble to have at it. To clean up another, Bone 7 still alive. Back once more, another Reaper Scythe is able to quickly finish off what looks like Bulba. Now come with me, trying to make his way out. Bulba buys back, he's back into the fight. Thank God, they finally called GG. This is your disconnect with Autopause, and this game is over. Yeah, they tried their hardest in that last fight, but in the end, the, the Mega Creeps are gone. The best laid plans of Mice and Men, it just all amounts to a hill of beans here. Actually, there was no Agadems on Eternal Envy. It's been on the Courier this whole really? time, because he had uh, Aegis. He had uh, six slots filled and didn't feel like dropping the mech, so... Bulba actually got to buy back after that side, but... It doesn't matter. They had just such a great advantage out of the laning phase. I love that aggro try. I, I looked at that and I said this has some real potential just from level one, and we got to see it in full. I, the cast was a kind of a thorn in their side, but I think Pilot Eye is really experienced as far as trying to get the exact distance he needs to to keep the tether but break the cask, and we saw that multiple times over. So really smooth play from Pilot Eye on the way. Uh, overall, I like the, the bottom lane relocate about. Eight minutes ago wasn't ideal, I don't think, and uh, he did miss one most recently on a BTB target, but in general, he played a great Wisp for 0, 8, and 15, can't complain, and obviously the linchpin of their lineup was EE -E on the front line there, and Fata also showing some supremacy. So Team Tinker, uh, I honestly think they could have held that against a conventional strategy. I think they, they had a good draft in general overall, and this is the best we've played seen them play in the past few games, but at Cloud9, they outgunned them with some really clever theory crafting. Yeah, I'm not going to be surprised if that Necrofo starts to appear more and more into uh, Cloud9's kind of draft lineups, the same way we've seen a lot of Drow and Visage. This could be something else to kind of pull out of their back pocket for a lot of the matches to come here, as Necrophos and Wisp, especially together, clearly showing a lot of potential here in this new meta. So with that said, the match is concluded. It's going to be Cloud9 who do come out on top. Uh, they will move and advance their record forward into a 4-2, and two. and of course this means for uh, Team Tinker, they fall once more, and now they're going to be at 6-5 and five as they get ready to finish out the last remainder of their games. It's actually getting pretty scary, and they could be seeing a, a quick tiebreaker situation here from what was once the number one spot, clear and far ahead. With that said, we do have one more best of one to wrap up already this very, very long day at Dota. It is going to be Cloud9 again, a doubleheader for them as they will be taking on the Balkan Bears, BBC. We'll be back in just a moment with that action. If you like what you heard, you can catch us on Twitter. Myself, Coddle Guy, and of course, Blaze for joining me. Thank you so much. Catch him on his Twitter. Show him your support by catching out Blaze Casting. We'll be back in just a moment after this small break. <laughs> 